Hello, my name is Eric Claussen, and I want to talk a little bit about Morris, William Morris Davis, who is often credited as being the father of North American geomorphology and the father of North American physical geography. Or in this lecture, I'm going to refer to him as the father of geology's unrecognized paradigm problem. And the paradigm problem that uh, I'm going to be talking about is the fact that Geologists ignore almost all of the topographic map, drainage system, and erosional landform evidence that the United States Geological Survey has uh, published uh, since the uh, beginning of the topographic map program, which began uh, in Davis's time and had continued uh, for more than 100 years. Now, Davis was a late 18th and 19th uh, late 19th and early 20th century Harvard University professor who, through his teaching publications and other apt, uh, activities, helped establish the geomorphology discipline, and he had many other accomplishments, a few of which I will comment on, uh, but uh, that uh, and that uh, if you want to know more about his accomplishments, I suggest reading uh, one of his biographies, uh, The History of the Study of Landforms, The Development of Geomorphology by Richard Chorley, Robert uh, Breckenstale, and Anthony J. Dunn. Um, this volume two is a detailed biography of William Morris Davis. In any case, uh, for our purposes, Davis was born in 1850 in Philadelphia. He was raised in Philadelphia except for one year during the Civil War when he was sent to uh, uh, the Boston area to go to school. Otherwise, um, he grew up uh, just outside uh, the city of Philadelphia. And uh, after he graduated from high school, he went to Harvard for uh, his bachelor's and master's degrees, and he later became a Harvard professor. He became famous for proposing erosion cycles, which uh, described how landform features develop over long periods of time uh, when a region is uplifted and then it, the erosion starts to cut into the region and the erosion continues until the region has been reduced to an almost featureless plain. And these erosion cycles are what are, are still um, recognized today in many textbooks, even though um, Davis's name may not be on it. Uh, now, here's an example of one of the erosion cycles that Davis proposed, uh, that what we're looking at here is uh, we're looking at a region that has recently been uplifted. Davis figures that uh, these uplifted regions usually uh, started out being relatively low in relief. Uh, and that uh, these low relief surfaces he would refer to as a peanut plain, and then streams would develop on this uplifted surface. The streams would start to cut narrow valleys into the uplifted surface, uh, but there would still be broad areas of the uplifted area that would not be eroded. And this is what he would call uh, the useful stage. And then as the stream valleys got wider, and the upland areas uh, shrank, uh, at least the upland surfaces shrank, that uh, this would produce a rugged topography that Davis referred to as a mature stage. And finally, as the uh, um, erosion proceeded to reduce the uh, landscape down to a relatively flat uh, surface again, or, or um, that uh, this he referred to as an old age stage, and this would be a new peanut plain at a lower level. And he re referred to these uh, low relief surfaces as peanut plains. Now, this uh, erosion cycle concept, he modified it for arid climates, for glaciated mountain regions, and he described it in much more detail than I 
described it. But uh, this concept has made it into many uh, introductory geography and geology textbooks, and it's still in many introductory geography and geology textbooks, although geologists today would probably suggest that the erosion process involves much more than what Davis described in these cycles. Now, Davis uh, also uh, achieved uh, quite a bit of fame in 1889 when he published in the then new National Geographic magazine an article in which he described how Pennsylvania's uh, rivers and valleys developed. And what he did is he used uh, evidence that geologists were coming up with, that there had been a big mountain range uh, down here where the Pennsylvania Piedmont is and uh, the New Jersey coastal plain. Um, and that this uh, big mountain range had uh, drained in a northwest direction and carried lots of sediment uh, into what is now uh, the interior of Pennsylvania, central Pennsylvania, and even uh, into western Pennsylvania. And that uh, Davis uh, tried to interpret uh, how the sediments had been carried, and he interpreted that there had been a northwest-oriented river that he called the Anthracite River, or the Ancestral Anthracite River, uh, that drained from these mountain ranges. Now, today, uh, geologists have a very different explanation for why the mountain range is there, but uh, because uh, we understand plate tectonics today, but uh, in Davis's day, they didn't uh, under, know anything about plate tectonics, but uh, they had another explanation for the mountains, which isn't important to us. But anyways, what Davis did uh, in his article is he started out with this Northwest-oriented anthracite river drainage system, and then he proceeded to show how the anthracite river had been dismembered uh, to produce the drainage systems that we see today in Pennsylvania. And in the process, he tried to explain how the water gaps in Pennsylvania had formed. He had trouble with the water gaps. Uh, and also when he wrote this article, he had no concept of the interval of time between the late Paleozoic and the present. Uh, so he was assumed, he probably left out many geologic events that, uh, uh, in, in, that took place uh, as this process was going on. And so uh, today, geologists probably wouldn't put too much stock into his interpretation. But anyways, it, at the time, this was a very uh, important research paper that was well received by the scientific community. And I, I need to put Davis in the right time frame because as I said, he didn't know anything about plate tectonics. Uh, he didn't have a good concept of absolute time because most of his published papers were written before radiometric age dating had been developed and he could only put geologic events in order and he had no way to measure absolute time. Also, uh, Davis, uh, while he supported efforts to fund the then new United States Geological Survey topographic mapping program, and he probably spent a lot of time looking at the new topographic maps as they were issued, um, topographic maps for many areas of the United States were not published until many decades after Davis died. And finally, the concept of continental glaciation was brand new when Davis was a student. And uh, during his career, he did write about alpine glacial erosion and to a lesser extent about continental glaciation. But he, like most geologists of his time, did not see continental ice sheets or meltwater from those ice sheets as major erosion agents. Now, what Davis might have seen on the new topographic maps as they came out, uh, this map is a Harrisburg map, uh, and it came out in 1892. So this is telling you that uh, he didn't have a lot of topographic maps to work with when he wrote his Rivers and Valleys of Pennsylvania article, uh, because this was three years after his article was published. Now, what he would have seen on this map uh, he undoubtedly saw the south-oriented Susquehanna River here, and it's flowing through 
uh, water gaps eroded across these three mountains here. This is Peterson Mountain. This is Second Mountain. This is Third Mountain here, but the Susquehanna doesn't cut across it. And this is uh, Blue Mountain here. Uh, and the Susquehanna River has cut deep water gaps across these mountains. And Davis was very keenly aware of these water gaps uh, because uh, during uh, his youth, he had actually traveled along this route. Uh, but in any case, uh, he would have noted that the tops of these mountain ranges are all about the same elevation. Uh, so this he would have interpreted to be evidence that there had been a peanut plain and that the peanut plain had been uplifted um, and eroded. And then he would have noted that there was a, that many of these lower areas are uh, at roughly the same elevation. And he would have uh, considered this to be a new painted plane that was in the process of being developed. So these would have been the major types of features that Davis would have looked at and would have been uh, emphasizing. He would have uh, ignored a lot of the other evidence on the map. Uh, and we'll see uh, as I progress, uh, I'll point out uh, some of the types of things he would have ignored. Now, he was a very influential professor, um, and he had a very uh, good teacher who, uh, in his grandmother, who taught him probably uh, how to influence people. Um, and I'll comment on her in just uh, in a few slides. And um, he was teaching at one of North America's most influential universities, and he trained students there who graduated. And then during their career, they taught the ideas that Davis taught them. So Davis played a major role in establishing the uh, geology, geomorphology, and ge ge geography paradigms uh, that we now have. Uh, Davis was a prolific writer who published more than 500 substantial scientific articles and books, including several widely used textbooks, and he traveled extensively. And in his travels, he frequently provided lectures both to uh, public audiences and to uh, university audiences. He uh, was very active in professional organizations uh, in the geology and uh, geography uh, disciplines, and he helped found uh, organizations such as the Geological Society of America, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and he regularly attended uh, professional meetings. He presented papers at the professional meetings. He published papers in various professional society journals. He was networked uh, very well across uh, the uh, academic community and also across the geography, the larger geography and uh, geology uh, community. He lobbied Congress to obtain funding for the then new United States Geological Survey topographic mapping project, and he claimed to actively study new maps as they were published, and he also prob uh, received advanced copies of some of the maps uh, before they were officially issued, and uh, you will see uh, an example of that a little later in this lecture. Now, Davis... Um, in spite of all these accomplishments, he uh, I'm going to uh, point out that he also uh, was the father of geology's unrecognized paradigm problem. And the paradigm problem that I'm talking about is that the geological research community today is ignoring the topographic map, drainage system, and erosional landform evidence because the accepted geology and glacial history paradigm cannot explain that evidence. And this problem has existed uh, since uh, Davis established the problem in 1890, and I will talk about that uh, in the, as we progress through the lecture. Now, uh, and uh, Davis, as I said, while being an advocate of the United States Geological Survey topographic mapping project and claiming to study the new maps as they were issued, um, he rarely published uh, interpretations of the drainage system and erosional landform features that those maps showed. And 
there were two papers that he did publish. Uh, one uh, that uh, he published under his name, and the other one, which was published uh, under the name of uh, his student, Robert de Courcy Ward, who was uh, a bachelor's degree student who graduated and later became a Harvard professor in climatology. Um, they uh, interpreted a few drainage system features on the then new Doylestown, Pennsylvania topographic map. But as I'm going to point out uh, as we go through the lecture, all, most of the important drainage system features on that map are not mentioned. And so in, in that one paper, Davis uh, and uh, also his uh, uh, student and colleague, uh, Robert DeCourcy Ward, established the precedent for ignoring most topographic map drainage system and erosional landform evidence. Uh, so uh, now, how did uh, Davis develop his skills to influence other geographers and geologists? Well, the loc I, to, to find out how, uh, you need to go back to his boyhood. And the location where William Morris Davis grew up, at least after he was five years old, is uh, marked with a historic marker, but it's not for William Morris Davis, it's for his grandmother. His grandmother was Lucretia Mott, who was a very ardent abolitionist and women's right advocate. Uh, and uh, today, the Mott and Davis houses no longer stand, but uh, they were uh, right one, the Motts lived on one side of Old York Road, and the Davises lived on the other side, and this is just outside the city of Philadelphia on Old York Road in what is now uh, the Melrose Park area, and I'll show you a map of that uh, in a later slide. Now, William Morris Davis's father was a real estate developer. Uh, he had partners in his business interests, but he the he was a significant owner of those interests, and they they owned and developed large areas of Cheltenham Township, which is the township just outside Philadelphia, where the uh, the Motts and the Davises were living, uh, and. Uh, he also uh, owned with a Bradford County, Pennsylvania coal mine and railroad. And in addition, he owned substantial coal lands in Harlan County, Kentucky. Now, as a boy, uh, Davis did visit the coal mine and railroad up in Bradford County, that's near Tawanda. And uh, Davis, I'm sure, was able to explore uh, the land holdings that uh, they had in the Cheltenham Township area because they surrounded where he was living and his father controlled uh, uh, major parts of the land, which he later sold off uh, to uh, various uh, uh, people for uh, states. And then he developed it uh, some of the land, and uh, you can even find the Davis influence uh, in the names of some of the streets in Melrose Park. Uh, Davis also um, took advantage of the coal lands in Harlan County, uh, Kentucky, uh, to uh, invite uh, the Harvard University Geology Department to uh, hold uh, their uh, summer field course uh, there, and that uh, helped Davis uh, uh, eventually establish the connections that got him his faculty position at Harvard uh, after he had graduated. Now, Lucretia Mott uh, was uh, uh, very influential, and I'm sure as a boy, uh, Davis would go across the street uh, to visit his grandmother, and he probably learned a lot of skills about how to influence people from her. Um, and this is showing uh, the Mott House. I, I don't have a picture of the Davis House. Now, in 1889, this is the same year that Davis published uh, his Rivers and Valleys of uh, Pennsylvania article in the National Geographic magazine. Davis received an advanced copy of the uh, what it became the 1890 Doylestown map, 
topographic map. Now, this is an isolated map that was produced uh, probably because the uh, Philadelphia Water Department wanted this area mapped. And uh, this is uh, Doylestown here. This is the Sus uh, Delaware River flowing in a south direction here. And this is Tohicken Creek. And I will show you uh, in large sections of it uh, in the next slide. Um, and Davis uh, in this decided uh, when he got this map, he uh, found an area over in here where he was got all excited because he saw that uh, a Tohicken Creek tributary was capturing drainage from an e the Perkamung Creek uh, drainage basin. And so he published a paper on this. And uh, here's the what he published about. Here's the Delaware River again. This is Doylestown down here. And uh, this is Tohicken Creek here flowing to the Delaware River. Um, and it's cut a fairly narrow valley here. The Delaware River has cut a deep valley here. And Davis saw that these valleys had cut into an upland surface. And he described the upland surface a little bit, suggesting that it might have been a plain. And then he looked at Deer Run here, which is a Tohicken Creek tip tributary. Tohicken Creek comes in like this from the north. So, uh, and uh, that... Uh, this is the drainage divide between uh, the Deer Run and the east branch of Perkamung Creek, which is uh, starts out right here and flows in a southwest direction um, before it joins the uh, uh, before it becomes a south oriented uh, Perkamung Creek. Now Perkamung Creek today flows to the Schuylkill River, which it did back then as well. And Davis looked at this drainage divide area, and he concluded that Deer Run has captured what was a tributary um, or part of the headwaters of the uh, east branch of Perkimum Creek. And he may be correct in that interpretation. I don't want to say he's not correct. Um, and he, he, because Deer Run and per Tohicken Creek have a much steeper gradient uh, to get to the Delaware River Valley than the East Branch of Perkamum Creek has to get to the Schuylkill River because uh, the distance that Perkamum Creek travels to get to the Schuylkill River is much, much longer than uh, the distance uh, from in this direction to get to the Delaware River. So this is the uh, asymmetric uh, Delaware Schuylkill River drainage divide here. Now, Davis doesn't say anything about how this drainage divide originated, uh, and he should have been interested in how that drainage divide originated, although he's suggesting that the drainage divide used to be even uh, closer uh, to uh, the Delaware River uh, than it is now. And Davis doesn't say anything about the north branch of the Chamonix Creek, which starts right here and flows in a southwest direction, um, uh, uh, roughly parallel to the east branch of Perkimum Creek. He doesn't say anything about the drainage divide here between the Chamonix Creek drainage basin and the Perkimum Creek drainage basin, which is um, the, also the drainage divide between the Delaware River and the uh, uh, Schuylkill River. And the Chamonix Creek um, while it is a Delaware River tributary, it travels on a very different route uh, for a considerable distance before it joins the Delaware River than the route that the Delaware River um, uh, takes to get to the same place. Also, Davis doesn't say anything about these uh, north West, uh, northeast oriented Delaware tributaries here. Uh, and I'll point out more features as, uh, on some other uh, sections of the map. Now, here's where that map is. Uh, Philadelphia is down here. Uh, this is uh, where the map area is. Doylestown is about here. Uh, this is the Delaware River that you were seeing. This is the north branch of the Chamonix Creek here. 
This is the East Branch of Perkimum Creek. And here's what the East Branch of Perkimum Creek is doing. Uh, it comes down here and joins the Schuylkill River that comes down uh, and eventually joins the Delaware River uh, uh, south of Philadelphia. The Delaware River, on the other hand, is coming like this in a southeast direction to a little beyond Trenton. Then it turns in a southwest direction uh, to uh, get to Philadelphia. Neshaminy Creek, what happens here is the north branch of Neshaminy Creek uh, turns, uh, it joins the west branch and then turns and flows in a southeast direction. Um, so it's effectively a barbed tributary uh, to Neshaminy Creek. And Davis, and this is on the map, I'll show this to you. Um, and Davis doesn't say anything about that. But Davis, uh, he didn't uh, have a really good maps of the adjacent areas to work with uh, in 1889. But he, he did have maps that showed in a general sense what the drainage uh, systems were. And he'd also grown up here. So he knew uh, 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 something about the drainage area in the uh, Philadelphia area. Now, as I said, Davis missed these uh, barbed tributaries that are flowing uh, in a northeast direction to the south oriented uh, Delaware River. He missed through valleys or valleys that cross the drainage divide. The dashed line, red line here is the drainage divide between the Neshaminy Creek drainage basin and the Delaware River uh, drainage basin. And he missed, um, so these through valleys indicate that water once flowed across these drainage divide, the drainage divide at these locations. Uh, and he missed that. So he didn't say anything about it. So in this respect, he's ignoring evidence that he should have been able to see and explain. Uh, now, coming back here, as I said, he He's not explaining the drainage divides, how the drainage divides form. Uh, there's a water gap down here that he's missing. Uh, so he's missing a lot of evidence that he should have been seeing. And that, uh, and two years later, uh, Robert DeCourcy Ward, who, as I said, was a senior at uh, Harvard, uh, studying under Davis at the time, um, and uh, later, uh, as I said, uh, de Courcy Ward would become a Harvard professor uh, and working alongside Davis, uh, de Courcy Ward uh, took over the climatology uh, part of the geography department uh, when Davis uh, took over uh, as chairman of the geology department at Harvard. But anyways, uh, what de Courcy Ward, uh, who says he was receiving help from Davis, although Davis's name is not on the paper. Uh, de Courcy Ward says that uh, Tinicum Creek here um, has is in about to capture uh, the headwaters of Tohicken Creek here. And that uh, so here we're looking at uh, Tinicum Creek has cut a deep uh, valley into the upland surface, which is uh, consistent with what Davis had described. And uh, Timikin Creek as uh, uh, now uh, turns in a, makes a sharp bend here, which uh, suggests that it, it captured a south oriented drainage route. And uh, Ward does describe that capture. And Ward goes on to suggest that this tributary of Timikin Creek is eroding headward and will capture uh, Tohicken Creek at this point here. So that Tohicken Creek will eventually flow uh, to uh, Timikin Creek and then up here to the Delaware River this way instead of flowing uh, the way that the route that it flows now. And again, I don't want to say that he's wrong he might be right, uh, but he's also ignoring a lot of uh, evidence. In his paper, he says that in the area, uh, there are folded structures and that the streams do cut across the folded structures, uh, which uh, should uh, be an indication that those are 
where the streams cut across those folder structures that there are water gaps. But he doesn't uh, say anything about water gaps, and he doesn't explain about how the streams were able to erode across the folded structures. So again, uh, there is selected evidence being taken off the map, but uh, mo much of the evidence is still being ignored. And that, uh, and looking further on the map, and this is an area that they don't comment on at all. Uh, this is where the north branch of Neshaminy Creek joins the west branch of Neshaminy Creek at Chalfont. And you can go out there and see it today. Um, in any case, uh, they don't say anything about the Neshaminy Creek uh, drainage basin and uh, how the Neshaminy Creek drainage uh, uh, system developed because it's a very fascinating drainage system. Uh, here we have southwest oriented North Branch Neshaminy Creek, southwest oriented Pine Run, southwest oriented Cooks Run, and we have some other smaller southwest oriented streams joining the east oriented uh, Neshaminy Creek uh, here. And Neshaminy Creek makes some very interesting uh, uh, large meanders in this area, um, which uh, are, are there today. In fact, there's some parks, so you can walk up and see some of these today, uh, especially in this area where Cook's Run uh, comes in. Uh, and this is all clearly shown on the Doylestown, the 1890 Doylestown map, uh, but they don't say anything about this. And this, to me, is some of the most interesting uh, information on the map in terms of drainage system evidence. And what Davis and uh, Ward should have been seeing when they looked at this map, uh, and I'm showing it to you uh, uh, where you can't see the details, uh, they should have been seeing uh, the northeast-southwest orientation of the ridges and valleys here, um, which is just predominant across the whole region. And this is an indication uh, that uh, the, there must have been a southwest oriented drainage system flowing across the region prior to the headward erosion of the Delaware River Valley. Well, Davis is so uh, fixed on trying to explain this evidence in the concept of his erosion cycles that he it fails to see this evidence. And so uh, this is a uh, how he basically is beginning to ignore uh, the uh, uh, topographic map evidence as it comes out. And this is one of the earliest topographic maps that was published for Pennsylvania, uh, at least uh, that uh, Davis was uh, able to know, that uh, Davis uh, worked with. Now, uh, in 1893, which uh, was four years after Davis received the advanced copy of the Doylestown map, uh, the United States Geological Survey published the Germantown map, and this showed the area where Davis grew up. Uh, this is Philadelphia down here, and uh, this is the Philadelphia city line here, um, which was established in 1850 when the city and county of Philadelphia merged. And you can see most of this area here is undeveloped at the time the map was uh, produced. And uh, Davis grew up uh, in this area right around here. I'll show it in more detail. Uh, but uh, anyways, when Davis was growing up, it was even less developed than uh, what we have see here. Now, this is a showing that where Davis grew up in more detail. This is the Philadelphia city line here. Um, this is uh, uh, Chestnut Hill over here, and Davis grew up in what is now the Melrose Park area. Elkins Park is about here. This is Jenkintown, and Fox Chase is over here. And uh, that uh, in 1893, uh, this is four years after Davis has published his uh, Rivers and Valleys of Pennsylvania article in the National Geographic magazine. Um, and it's uh, two years after he's published another article on the rivers and valleys of northern 
Department of Northern New Jersey. So he's the expert on drainage systems uh, and erosional landform evidence in this area. And he should have been interested in the types of features that I've shown with red numbers on this map. The red number here, number one, is where he grew up. And I'm going to show you this region in more detail in the next slide. Uh, and uh, then I'll show you uh, these regions uh, here in the slide following that. Now, here's where Davis grew up. And this is Tuckanee Creek, which uh, flows in this direction here. It becomes Tuckanee Creek and then Frankfurt Creek. Um, anyways, Davis should have been very familiar with Tuckanee Creek because he could just walk down the hill from where he grew up uh, into the Tuckanee Creek Valley. And I'm sure he did that many times as a boy. But uh, he also should have uh, known that uh, up here north of Jenkintown um, is a valley uh, where Old York Road goes across, um, goes north from Jenkintown up into what is on the map shown as Abington and then up towards Willow Grove. Now, at the time uh, that uh, this area was not really developed, uh, although Jenkintown was definitely there when uh, uh, Davis was growing up, and I'm and Old York Road was definitely there when Davis was growing up because it was a major stage route. And uh, Davis must have uh, gone up to Jenkintown and then gone down the hill here to the valley at uh, Noble. And he must have seen that valley. And even if he didn't, uh, he should have, once the map came out, he should have noticed that there's a, this is a dry valley that the streams on this side go to Tuckanee Creek and the drainage on this side goes to Pennypack Creek over here. And both of these are South Orient uh, Delaware River tributaries, but there's uh, no stream uh, at Noble. Uh, so uh, Davis should have been interested in how did that valley get eroded? But he doesn't tell us anything about that because he never published anything about the Germantown map. And he should have been interested in this uh, wind gap over here that's cut in a sandstone ridge that's known as Edge Hill. But he doesn't say anything about that. And he should have been interested in this uh, wind gap over here at that's labeled Edge Hill. This is between uh, Glenside and what is now North Hills over here. Um, and he may be, he must have, he probably noticed this on the 1893 map because on the 1893 map, uh, this wind gap was not correctly shown. I'm showing you the 1894 edition. Uh, somebody raised a fuss with the United States Geological Survey about this wind gap because. It, the uh, United States Geological Survey republished the 1893 map uh, in 1894 with the uh, wind gap here corrected uh, to correctly show it as I'm showing it here. Davis should have wondered about how those wind gaps formed. Um, and uh, here uh, I'm showing you uh, further uh, away uh, some areas further to the north and west of the Davis home. The Davis home is here. I've shown Old York Road in red. The Noble Valley is here. Uh, the wind gap uh, that I showed you before with the number three is largely here. The uh, other wind gap here that he sh should have known uh, because Lime Kiln Pike goes through there and that was there when Davis was a boy. And there was a railroad that went through that when Davis was a boy. And Davis undoubtedly uh, took the train uh, out here um, to Fort Washington and maybe to Ambler and beyond uh, at that time. Uh, I don't know how often he would have, but he probably did a few times. Anyways, uh, Davis, when he got the map, he should have noted that the uh, sandstone ridge here, which these wind gaps are cut in, this is known as Edge Hill, um, that these, uh, uh, this sandstone ridge uh, is on the southeast side of a relatively flat Florida area. 
uh, which is the northeast extension of the Chester Valley that's primarily on the uh, southwest side of the Schuylkill River. And then on the other side of this uh, relatively flat floored lowland is another sandstone ridge. It's basically the same sandstone ridge. Uh, the geologic unit has just been folded over uh, so as to repeat the unit. Uh, but in any case, Davis should have been excited about what uh, Sandy Run is doing here. Sandy Run drains the northeast part of this lowland in a west direction uh, towards Wishahickon Creek, uh, which is over here and it's flowing south across the region. And I'll comment more on that in a minute. In any case, Sandy Run, instead of staying in the lowland area and to reach Wishahickon Creek and uh, flowing in a straight line, uh, basically to reach Wishahickon Creek, all of a sudden at Camp Hill, and that's the name of this hill here, uh, turns in a north direction and cuts a water gap uh, across the sandstone ridge and then turns in a west direction to join uh, Wishahickon Creek. And Wishahickon Creek then flows in a, a different water gap uh, across the same sandstone ridge and into the lowland here. And Wishahickon Creek, uh, Davis should have uh, been aware that this lowland extends in a west direction to the Schuylkill River Valley. And Wishahickon Creek uh, could have avoided uh, cutting through this uh, high upland area at Chestnut Hill by turning in a west direction uh, to flow to the Schuylkill um, River. But instead, Wishahickon Creek has cut a deep valley, it's more than 300 feet deep, into this uh, upland area here, which is cut in very uh, erosion-resistant rock. Um, it forms a deep gorge. It's a beautiful park today, and uh, Philadelphians are probably very happy that Wishahickon Creek did cut that gorge, but uh, Davis should have uh, uh, been interested in why uh, Wishahickon Creek was able to cut that gorge, uh, but uh, he never tells us, and uh, until I came along, nobody, uh, nobody, uh, really explained how that gorge uh, developed. And so uh, we have no knowledge of how that gorge developed it from the accepted paradigm uh, viewpoint. And so uh, Davis is uh, ignoring the evidence on this map that is, he that should be telling him that uh, things about Pennsylvania drainage history uh, that maybe don't fit with what he was saying in his Pennsylvania Rivers and Valleys article. And uh, here uh, I'm just showing you uh, the Wishahickon Gorge area uh, to show you more of it so you can see the whole thing. This is Chestnut Hill up here. Uh, this is Mount Airy here. And uh, that uh, this is Wayne Junction down here. Um, this is Maniunk here. And here uh, you can see that Wishahickon Creek is flowing in a south-southeast direction. It makes a jog here. And then it comes down here at, uh, and then turns in a southwest direction to join southeast-oriented uh, Schuylkill River as a barbed tributary uh, just uh, uh, south of Maniunk. And uh, Davis should have been interested in why Wishahickon Creek is doing this, and he should have been interested in why uh, many of the tributaries to Wishahickon Creek flow in a northeast direction to join a, a south-oriented uh, stream here. But he doesn't say anything about that uh, evidence. Uh, so uh, I suspect that Davis ignored the evidence he could not explain, and uh, because he never explained most of the Doylestown topographic map evidence, and he also never explained any of the evidence on the Germantown map. Uh, and but he did in his Pennsylvania. Uh, Rivers and Valleys article say that uh, the most of the drainage system evidence uh, was so mysterious 
that only the most advanced student would be able to understand it. And Davis apparently was not uh, in that category of being the most advanced students. And he didn't know anything about paradigms or anomalous evidence because those terms were introduced uh, until long after he died. But in, per but in those terms, what Davis was saying when he said that most uh, drainage system evidence was so mysterious that only the most advanced student could understand it, is that the evidence is anomalous evidence that the accepted paradigm uh, cannot explain. And to conclude, I want to just uh, say that Davis, without question, was one of the first in the geology and geography uh, disciplines uh, to use the newly uh, published topographic maps uh, in an effort to explain how drainage system and erosional landform uh, evidence developed. Unfortunately, Davis looked at those new maps from the perspective of his erosion cycle hypothesis, which did not explain most of the drainage system and erosional landform evidence. And um, as a result, Davis ignored most of that evidence, which to him was so mysterious that only the most advanced student could understand it. And by ignoring that drainage system and erosional landform evidence, he set a precedent for future geologists and geographers that has resulted in uh, today's unrecognized uh, paradigm problem. <laughs>